This is Screen Junkies Movie Fights. Brought to you by Nature Box. Now your host, Andy Signore. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Movie Fights. And I know I hype a lot of shows, but holy crap. Today is going to be a doozy. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to try my best. We've got some amazing questions, but it's even more fun because it's a blind fight. And it's three of our best fighters. Open up to the wide. Look who it is. Mr. Hal Rudnick. Most people might not know this, Hal. I don't know if they know this, but you have the most wins underneath the champ. Wow. Uh, I don't like how you phrase that. <laughs> um, there is a certain sexual connotation that I took away from that. But in today's blind movie fight, I hope to be Matt Murdock. Yeah, well, you're in. A lot of, uh, just for people to know, wow. Hal hasn't been on as often as we like because Hal's busy doing some exciting work. We're excited for oh, you. Oh, can I mention that? Go ahead. Sure. I'm writing on a Disney Channel, Disney XD show called Walk the Prank. Boom. It's in its second awesome, season. Man. And I'm enjoying the hell out of it. It's so super it's, fun. It's hard. We get very limited time with Hal because he's a busy guy, nine to five. Five, so we're, uh, he makes so, Screen Junkie show still happen, but it's yes. an honor to have you back on the show. Have Thanks, brother. The fans have Glad to be you. here. It's going to be a good one. All right, next to him, you guys have, have wanted to see him take on the champ because he is basically a killer in the speed round. Mr. Koi Jandra, welcome, Koi. I'm so excited. It's going to be here. I uh, feel honored to be amongst these two gentlemen. It's going to be a good fight. It's going to be fun. I'm prepared. And last but not least, he is the champ, Hi. the world reigning movie fights champion. You've defended that honor so many times, so, more I, times than I can many count. Many times, yeah. Mr. Dan Merle. Hi. How's now, Dan, I have to ask: Is yeah. this a belt mat or just a, just an exposition? You know, we talked, and I and I said it's been a long time since I was able to just kind of fight for fun. Just fight to have a good time. So I want. I just want to fight for fun. I want to have a good okay. time. No, so we're back to the old Dan. Back to the old Dan. We're we're fighting for bragging yeah. rights today. Bragging rights are good. All right. And if one of these people nice. beats you, then you might need to consider. If one, I think that it's pretty crystal clear that if I do not win, whomever is the victor today would have a pretty clear shot as the uh, as a, as a serious contender for the belt. All right. So like preliminary. I like yeah. it. It's like a. We yeah, need the prelims. NASCAR race. We're all trying to well, get our times in. Yes, this is going to be intense because I'm telling you, these three are three of our best. It's going to be very intense, and they're going to be fighting some amazing things such as uh, worst De Niro movie, uh, mm. best animal sidekick in a Disney movie, yeah. worst comic book movie, Ooh. and mm. best Scorsese movie. So these are some legit topics. Wow. Yeah. And what's so fun is it's a blind fight. You guys are going to have to go off basically on what you, you get because we're going to be random yeah. draws how this worked. Uh, <laughs> so if they pick the one you wanted, you're going to have to pivot and pick another one. So are you guys ready for this? Ready. My wheels are turning. Ooh. Before we start, I guess I have to introduce this guy on the, on the fan cam, uh, Joe Star. Hey, Joe. Hey, Andy. It's a dog day afternoon here on Movie Fights, brother. And I tell you, there is no puppy love lost on these competitors. <laughs> Fans on Twitter, hashtag Movie Fights Live, want to know if Hal and Coy are going to be more bite than bark and if old Dan's got any new tricks. <laughs> Joe, this episode is show? sponsored by the ASPCA. <laughs> why? Wh wh did I miss something? Why are you doing? Th why are the oh, bone puns? Oh, there's nothing. I love Joe. Joe, you love me, right? We're good, right? <laughs> yeah, we're fine. We're good. There's no drama Happy between holidays, Joe and I. Andy. Happy holidays, Joe. All right, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> you're gonna do your best over there to fact check things, right? Keep Completely things going. Completely partial strong. and down the middle, Andy. <laughs> Ooh, I'm there missing was something. There was drama last week. We're, we're amping oh, it up. gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. It's gotcha. Like wrestling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Those yeah. Like stone facing Joe. Oh, yeah. Should I take off my shirt and turn heel? <laughs> anyway, let me go okay. back to it. Yeah. Joe's really delightful, and I love Joe. But oh, of course. Joe, you suck. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, but here's how this is going to work, guys. You know how this game is played. I want to hype some things. At the end of this show, I'm going to hype some huge movie fights coming up that I don't know you guys are not going to want to miss, including the fan fights. You guys can still submit right now when that's going to happen, but if you haven't, uh, there you go, sj.plus fam. If you think you can come here under the lights and fight, you got a few more days or a week, I think, left, whatever it is, submit ASAP your video, two-minute video, and you could join us to fan fights. We're going to fly a bunch of fans out here to try and do this. It's going to be a blast. Are we going to put them up in five-star hotels? I don't know about a five-star. <laughs> they will be in a good hotel. And he was about to say, like, <laughs> they will be in a very above. safe, good hotel. They will have stars. They will have stars. <laughs> Plus some other epic fights that I will announce at the end. Remind me to announce. I like to tease, uh, so you'll stay tuned. That you there's are some a little big, <laughs> Some big fights uh, coming up that you guys will not want to miss live here on uh, ScreenDuckies.com or on YouTube. All right, before we start, I do have to thank today's sponsor. We're so happy to have him back. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Nature Box. Joe has the box over there, and I love Nature Box uh, because they make snacks that actually taste great and are better for you. They're created with high-quality ingredients, and they're free 
free from artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners, so you can feel great about snacking. And Joe over there has some options, some, some snacks uh, that are in there. There's over 100 snacks to choose from, like aged cheddar lentil loops and mini Belgian waffles. What Ooh. else is in there, Joe? Well, no more Belgian waffles because I ate them in the time it took you to say that sentence. <laughs> I hate but we've you, got Joe. Asiago and cheddar cheese crisps, which are dope. We've got hickory smoked turkey jerky. Oh, I do want that. Ooh. Also yeah. real dope. This is all, I actually want to try all that. Uh, and you guys, you can try all this to get it delivered right to your door. Uh, subscribers can order as much as you want, as often as you want, with no minimum purchase required, and you can cancel at any time. So go to naturebox.com slash screen junkies and sign up. Uh, is there, I guess there's no offer code. Just do that. Yeah. I don't have one on my script. I assume just go to naturebox.com slash screen junkies and tell them that we sent you and try a nature box. I, I actually love nature box. I've done it. It's oh, delicious. sure. I mean, um, guilt free snacking. Sign me yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, it's good to get like it all sent to you and fresh, fun stuff. So thank you, nature box. Please go support them. Uh, and thank you, Joe, for showing off the food. You did it well. Thanks. I will give you that compliment. Thanks, boss. <laughs> all right, let's do this. <laughs> Come on, let's get nuts. I want to fight you. You want to fight? Let him fight. Fine! Start this fight, I'll kill you. I could do this all day. All right, guys, here we go. Round one. We drew straws. This is how it happened. Okay. So that's the order we're going to go with today, and then it's going to take turns every, every time, so that's how it's going to work. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. So, Hal, you're up first, okay. and you get to do the first blind fight, and it's a big one. What is the worst Robert De Niro performance? Ooh. Hal, you get to go first. Oh my, okay. All right. Remind so, everyone at home, this is a blind fight, so they have not been able to prepare, and they don't know what the other ones are going to pick. Go ahead, Hal. Okay, so uh, Robert De Niro has an incredible IMDb, obviously, but he's made some stinkers, and there are many uh, substandard Robert De Niro films and a few performances. Now, in thinking of this, the question said performance. It did say performance. So I'm going to put aside some of the bad Robert De Niro films and go to what I believe is his worst performance. That's what the question also asks. Also a terrible film, and that would be The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay, there we go. The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. He made choices as an actor that made the hair stand up on my neck and made me want to just scratch the skin off of my own face, leaving a red mask of blood. I was so infuriated watching his comedic over-the-top choices. Um, it was a very caricature, uh, caricature-ish, cartoony, poorly chosen derivative villain that he played. All of his choices, it was like he took pieces of like, huh, what's the standard bad guy in a cartoon sound like? And then, in addition, he jumped the shark with that role. He had already been doing other roles that brought his career down several notches, several pegs, but for him to parody himself with you talking to me, that was the stake in the heart of his integrity. All right. If that doesn't pull the rug out from under him performance-wise more than anything else, I don't know what is. All right, Coy, let's go to you. What do you think is the worst De Niro performance? So mine is very recent. Uh, it was the first movie I've seen in a long time that starred any actor of his acclaim that made me physically uncomfortable, and that is the Zac Efron magnum opus, Dirty Grandpa. Now, <laughs> Dirty Grandpa is not only offensive to the demographic it's trying to appease, it's offensive to everyone involved with that film, because you have Zac Efron, who's been working very hard to get credible, so I would love to see him work with De Niro, but then De Niro does a performance that feels like you're watching your grandpa, who doesn't have any actor, acting experience, wander into frame and just say things. It wasn't acting, it wasn't performing, it was a man who like just needed the paycheck so bad, he said whatever perverse things were thrown at him. It was uncomfortable on levels that made you feel like you were watching American Pie with your grandma, because you were experiencing an elderly person try to experience youth culture. So it was like tears of... Why is this happening? I'm uncomfortable. I know you're uncomfortable. Is this what it's like to sell out? You're Robert De Niro. Why are any of us here? <laughs> Nobody had any victory there. You couldn't pay me to talk to De Niro about that performance, much less watch that movie again. It was the most agonizing experience, and I never thought I would not want to see dick jokes come out of De Niro's mouth, but now that I've seen it, it's a fate worse than death. 
Doesn't he like have sex with Aubrey Plaza? And, and somehow too? that's not pleasant. Yeah, okay. You expect that to be a good time. It isn't. Dan, you, you guys are no fun. Uh, here's my choice. <laughs> Uh, and this was one that came from the 90s. There was a bit of a horror resurgence in the 90s. And this was a risk that Robert De Niro took that I don't think paid off in the least. It is his role as Frankenstein's monster in <laughs> Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with Kenneth Brenna as the mad scientist, uh, Frank, Dr. Frankenstein. Um, I get why I wanted to do this, I guess, because Gary Oldman played Dracula. And everyone was like, ooh, <laughs> Gary Oldman was great as Dracula. So he's like... Okay, I'll play Frankenstein. But that's the problem is that's how he played Frankenstein. He's got the stitches and everything, but every time they're like, oh, look at him. Like, everyone's got, like, the Victorian things. It's Frankenstein's monster. And he's like, yeah, I don't take a thing. Like, he's playing Robert De Niro. He's like, eh, you know, I'm doing this. Like, he's, like an, he's, like, doing a parody of Igor from the original Universal Monsters. Like, we belong dead. It's just, it is so laughable and so over the top and just so not in sync with the rest of that movie. Like, at least Dracula had that really weird Francis Ford Coppola sense of just going over the top and Keanu Reeves is there for some reason and it made sense why Gary Oldman was acting like a crazy person. <laughs> but De Niro's there. He's trying to be a monster, but he's still just kind of De Niro. He could have gone way over the top, but instead he just kind of went for like... You know, Robert De Niro, and it did not work at all. It was a bad choice. It was a poor performance. And in a movie called Frankenstein, if Frankenstein doesn't work <laughs> as the monster, you're in trouble. All right, guys. Well, I will contend that Frankenstein is actually the doctor. Uh, so it is Frankenstein's monster. I, so in a movie called Frankenstein, explicit. you might think about uh, the doctor. Also, um, he made an over the top choice in The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle, and it was so much more unnerving and skin-crawling than that performance. That performance was lukewarm. This performance was just, I am getting gutted over and over again. Well, let me, I, I can I like ask you something? You sure. said it was comedic, over-the-top, and cartoony, and he's playing the standard bad guy from a cartoon. A he cartoon? is playing the standard it's bad guy from a cartoon. Lincoln. There's literally a cartoon <laughs> moose and squirrel next to him in the movie. He did it in such a way where it was so unwatchable, it was like nails on a chalkboard for 90 minutes to two hours, what however long it was. What did you think he was going to do in the movie? There's no version of Rocky Bullwinkle and De Niro that would be anything else than that. Yeah. Possibly do something where he could immerse himself and play a wonderfully fun villain, rather <laughs> than... It was like he, the it was like nose, he ripped off... He had the monocle. It was it, it, a good time. Yes, like if you put that role, if you gave that role to say Alan Cumming, Alan Cumming, or um, let's say... Um, a young, like a young Michael Caine, someone who could pull off, uh, or a Heath Ledger, or, or someone Whoa. who could. I feel like in both of these, they, he was having a good time. He got to play Frankenstein. He got to play. In my movie, he not only didn't have a good time, no one had a good time. It felt like De Niro literally got lost, ended up on set with Zac Efron, and then just said dick a lot. Like, nobody had a good experience. At least there he got to, like, that was a passion project for him. This was a passion project for him. How did this happen? How did this performance get so off guard that he just, like, wanted... Maybe he wanted to show up and say dick and balls a bunch of times. Hey, come but on! But he just did the intern. Come he just on. had a comedy resurgence. The intern was just before that. We learned he could do comedy. He'd had his little Fockers experience. There was no reason for this performance to be so bad, because we saw that he could do it. That was an experiment. That I wouldn't Mention experiment. little fuckers <laughs> in, uh, in, in as an example yeah, of exactly. we know he could do comedy. But, but, the, the, <laughs> but the monster and and yeah, I mean the, the, the monster is uh, Boris Karloff did great. Like you can really bring some great acting gravitas to that role. And the fact that he didn't do that at all and just kind of his his way through that movie. It's just I just he's on a completely different level from anyone else in that movie. Um, and I feel like Dirty Grandpa. He didn't. He, 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 it is unlike anything Coy's, you've seen him Coy's do before. main point was that the, the material was beneath him. It wasn't about the performance. Well, Dan's, ma Dan's main point was that he was kind of, yeah, he was kind of, uh, it was half monster, half De Niro. This performance, this performance was a choice and it practically ruined the movie. Uh, and on top of that, he gave that devastating line of, are you talking to me? But which causes you to take pause. This performance caused you to take pause and look back on this whole man's career and ask yourself, does it add up? Is, am I buying into fool's gold here? That was the line in this performance. He delivered the moment that soured 
everyone but he, on Robert De Niro. You're right. You're, you're killed. Sour, 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 everyone on yeah, Robert I feel De Niro. Like he was just and everything to come else back hey, the, it, No, actually, it was the fan that uh, I think caused us to take pause a little bit. But Rocky but and Bullwinkle, was, though, like I remember hearing about that movie, and the thing that I heard was about that scene, and it's like, oh, Robert De Niro is playing with his image. He's doing an homage. Like he's right. he's having fun with his career, and a lot of actors do that. And again, like the, the performance, it is a cartoon movie. This is a movie that he wanted to make. I'm not going to buy that old age. He shepherded that movie through production. For years. For years. He wanted to do Rocky and Bullwinkle, and he had a lot, he had a really good time playing and that yeah, That's that wonderful. wonderful. That's, that's all wonderful. It fit the movie. But it that fit doesn't the tone. change the fact that, no, his, his cartoon villain, like, he. He's inept. He cannot play that. I w- would not cast Robert De Niro. I would cast him okay, to play something. I, got, I would not I, cast him as a voice I, actor. I get all all these are, are bad. Let's agree to that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. last clo- po- closing points here. Why why is the why are the other two worse? Or I not fe- as bad. I mean, I, I feel like the tone of the performance in both of your films was appropriate for the film. I'm not talking about my credibility of the script or what have you. The performance in in mine could have made Robert De Niro more of a wide range actor. The performance in yours fit the tone. The performance in yours fit the tone. The performance in mine was cringeworthy to a level that it distracted from the whole movie and the movie had no chance of recovering itself. He played a cartoon and a cartoon villain. He played Frankenstein and Frankenstein. This movie just made you feel like your grandpa was in the movie with you just making you uncomfortable in front of your girlfriend. And that's not a performance. That's not knowing how to act. And that is a bad performance. Dan? I think that mine is the worst because it really severely handicapped the film. You had a role that required some good acting. It did not get his best. It was just Robert De Niro under some makeup, making the Robert De Niro face and not really bringing any (laughs) acting to it. I think Hal didn't like the tone of the movie that Robert De Niro was in. I think Coy didn't like the material of the movie and he thought it was beneath Robert De Niro doing it. But I think my performance was the worst because it completely crippled the entire film. Hal? Coy's choice. Uh, he's saying it, it was cringeworthy because he was like it was like you were there with the, uh, your grandfather. That sounds like that was an effective thing. It's supposed to be a dirty, weird grandpa that you wouldn't want to be a part of. Mission accomplished. Uh, and like your main argument was that the material was beneath him. And uh, to Dan's point, uh, how's how's a monster supposed to talk? Okay, he did it half De Niro, half monster. It was his De Niro monster. Whatever that he made a choice here. This was the most misguided. It was nails on a chalkboard. Yes, you're supposed to be big. And yes, he shepherded it through. That should have helped him. Instead, it hurt him. And someone, I think he's a victim of no one told him no. And uh, he just went above and beyond excruciating, cringeworthy acting. It, it's like, ooh, he's like Dr. Evil. Exactly. Meets, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> it was so for. terrible that and derivative. And he parodied himself and lost. Okay, any other final cl- closing thoughts? Um, I, I have no Let's problem. Let's see who you picked. I have no <laughs> I'm waiting for the bell. There we go. Oh, hey, bell. All right. There, <laughs> there it was. All right. Taffy, <laughs> 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 All right, Joe Star over there on the on the boards. Uh, Twitter's got some thoughts. Uh, Nolan Dean says a uh, little fuckers. De Niro did not give a single fuck. A uh, fuck. A fuck. Yes. Uh, 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 even though I don't agree with anything you say, you're still a funny guy, Andy Signore. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Tigerson says I'm pretty sure we all know it's Night Falls. It was so bad it's not even listed on his uh, IMDb. Uh, <laughs> he was Classic. great at Night Falls. Yeah. David Bowman uh, says whatever his character's name is, start. Was in Stardust, and I can't disagree with you more, David Bowman. That is a I great love performance. Him. He was a, he was a yeah. fancy, so, fun pirate yeah. in Stardust. There's not a lot of facts, Andy. To you know, it's a, it's an opinion round. But I, I went to the uh, to the opinions of a, of one of the most famous movie opinion guys there is, Robert Ebert. Who had this to say Robert, about Robert, all three Robert, 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 Is that Roger's brother? <laughs> Who's that? Dot com. Oh, my bad. Oh, that Robert Ebert. Robert Ebert. Ron, oh, my God. <laughs> well, girly. hold on. Hold the horses. What did Robert Ebert say? <laughs> you know what's weird? I copy and pasted that. That was really weird. <laughs> anyway, Roger Ebert. Yeah, I just get big CT. Yeah, I had uh, JT and install a boo sound just because I knew you would need it. I, I used to I love your show here. with that guy Jake Siskel. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jake Siskel. What Jake Siskel say? I love his... Well, I- Oh, man. All right, um, but tell us more about Robert Ebert. <laughs> well, Robert uh, says this. Uh, I admired the scenes with De Niro so much. Uh, For what I'm, are we I'm, talking about? Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Okay, yeah, yeah. I admired the scenes with Robert De Niro so much, I'm attempted to give Mary Shelley's Frankenstein a favorable verdict. 2.5 out of 3 stars. 
Uh, with he uh, what did he out say? Of four stars. He did what his reviews on four. They gave three. This is Robert Ebert. <laughs> <laughs> three stars. Did he review uh, ro- uh, the other two performances? Uh, no, he, he couldn't did. have reviewed Dirty Grandpa. Uh, uh, no, the website. Did. Robert the website. might have. We don't know. Robert uh, said he'd like uh, Dirty Rocky Grandpa. Uh, might be his own Plan Nine from Outer Space. <laughs> a bomb. Uh, and Bullwinkle, yes, uh, adored it. Robert Ebert adored it? Absolutely adored it. Good old Robert, absolutely adored okay. it. <laughs> All right. Are you trolling? <laughs> <laughs> Live on air. Just they loved trolling. you last week, Joe. They're not going to love you this week. <laughs> it's uh, okay. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, we all love you, Joe. Robert Ebert, the dog yeah. reviewer. <laughs> the dog reviewer online. <laughs> Two paws up. First, our veteran Joe, now Roger Ebert. <laughs> Can we get Spencer in here on the cat? No. <laughs> that, uh, that movie really made my tail wag. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, poof, based on the arguments. Oh, and you have a Twitter? Did we do a Twitter poll? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Yeah, uh, me... No, we didn't use Twitter. We used uh, Twatter. We used Twatter. Oh, Twatter poll. Okay, yeah. we have a Twatter poll. Great. <laughs> Jesus. Um, based on the arguments, <clears throat> it was actually really neck and neck. You guys are the best. So some of the best. So that makes sense. But I, I was really, I was listening to your final closing, and I was swayed by Hal. I mean, when you sort of turned Coy's argument against him and said, well, that actually kind of makes it effective... And that he's playing a monster. It is what it is. Uh, I got to give Hal the ultimate point. So Hal, you're first on the board. Uh, what did the, what did the Twitter poll say? Uh, Twitter poll completely disrespected veteran fighter Dan Merle and uh, went with Coy's pick of Dirty Grandpa with 47 percent. Because Ooh. it came out last. Yours was in the 90s. No one watching was Ooh, alive. Was <laughs> <laughs> very true. Uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, yeah. 34. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was that your first choice, Dan? Was what? Yeah, we'll find out after. You'll never know. You brought up Nightfalls. A little. I'm gonna tease, guys. There's so many fun movie moments we've done over the past hundred episodes. Wouldn't it be cool if we counted down the top fifty ever? Whoa. Where Ooh. would Nightfalls fall in that rank? We will tell you more at the end of this episode. Stay Ooh, tuned. Ooh, nice tease. <laughs> <laughs> All right, round two. This one comes, uh, well, well, someone on Twitter has suggested it. Sorry we didn't pull your name. <laughs> uh, but this is an epic one. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to judge this one. Joe, we will need to put our our, 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 our thing on the side because I will need your help potentially here. Uh, this is an ultimate question. What is the best yeah. Martin Scorsese movie? Uh, there's a lot, though. So, Coy, you're up first. You get to pick first. Now, this is going to seem misguided, and I understand that the internet will probably be very upset that I chose something that... You know what I'm just going to say? The Departed, I feel like, is mm-hmm. the best Martin Scorsese movie because it is one of the most rewatchable movies ever, not just by Scorsese, by anyone. It reshaped how people perceived Boston. Before The Departed, it was there was movies that took place in New York where they were sometimes in Boston, or there was Good Will Hunting. The Departed made an entire subgenre of Boston crime film because of how good Scorsese's The Departed was. It had amazing performances by each and every member of the cast. The supporting actors were just as good as the lead actors. The lead actors were just as good as the editing, editing, the writing, everything about it. It won four Oscars in major categories. It won writing, it won best picture, it won best directing, and it won best editing. The movie is so tight, it is so perfect, it is so rewatchable that you get a full range of emotions where you're laughing at Alec Baldwin's crazy performance. You're endeared by Mark Wahlberg, which we had not been to that point. Like, Mark Wahlberg completely changed the game with that film. You don't know whether you love Matt Damon or Leonardo DiCaprio. It's got Matt Damon playing a villain and Leo playing a good guy, both against type, but also both switching back and forth because they're both undercover in other ways. You've got multifaceted performances by two of the best actors of our generations at their prime. Leo killing it in every scene he's in. Matt Damon... You don't know who to hate in that film until the very end, and it also has one of the best endings ever, wherein everyone gets offed and you don't know how to feel about it. That movie is visceral, it's impacting, it's effective, it's rewatchable, it's got an amazing soundtrack, and it is the best use of Scorsese's ability to make you care about crime, and that's what he does best. Dan. I mean, I could I could give you four different answers and argue them just as passionately, but I have to go with the one that jumped into my head as soon as you said, what's the best Scorsese movie? And that's Raging Bull. I think that Raging Bull is one of the greatest portraits of humanity, 
of a person of the weakness and how weakness inside of you can just eat away at you and how you can have everything that you need in the world as far as possessions as far as everything else goes and how if you don't have that thing within yourself that allows you to be happy with who you are that it will just eat you alive from inside we just talked about the worst robert de niro performances this was perhaps his best performance as jake lamada I think that Raging Bull is such a brilliant movie that it almost transcends being a Scorsese movie. Like, there's so many things like, you can say, oh, amongst Scorsese movies, this is the best. And amongst Scorsese movies, this one's the best. Raging Bull is one of the great movies of all time. And what he did in conjunction with the editing, with the camera work, with the acting, with the sound, the shooting in black and white, everything. It is just a beautiful, haunting, <clears throat> tragic, amazing movie. And I think it's his best. Hal, what are you going to pick? The answer is Goodfellas. Goodfellas is the movie that defined so many tropes for crime movies, mafia films, storytelling, the rise and fall. And it's the most echoed and aped and borrowed from of Scorsese's films. And it's the most impactful. You want to talk about performances across the board? Ray Liotta, Lorraine Bracco, and Robert De Niro, among others. So many of the tropes that it created, it set up. There would be no Sopranos without Goodfellas. There would be um, so many of the movies we love. There would be no Boogie Nights without Goodfellas. Goodfellas tells a great story. It takes us on this rise and fall of emotion. And it may be, I would call it the most rewatchable film of all time. Okay. Not only is it one of the, it is Scorsese's best, one of the most rewatchable. It's a clinic in editing, shooting, screenplay and character development across the board this film is just lights out all right guys fight it out when now, I think of a, hold on I just want to help make sure all three of these are great movies yes yes so you, yeah. you're, you've all sold For me very sure. well and why your films Much are respect. great but there's yeah. one when are we gonna say best yeah. Scorsese movie why over the other two go okay. ahead boy. yeah I think that these when I want to watch a crime film Goodfellas when I want to watch a portrait of a singular actor or a singular character absolutely raging I Bulls. agree with I think you that departed is as a movie the strongest film and I think it's more it's relaxing. also a crime movie so you just said but you'd rather watch Goodfellas no, no, than the departed because I don't, think the, I don't think of The Departed as a crime movie. I think of it as a what? movie. I literally, when I put in The Departed, I'm like, I'm not going to sit back and watch a crime film. I'm watching a movie about people, right, people right out of the real gate, experiences. Corey. Right out of the gate, the I got to say, the, um, the Departed is a, is a very good movie. It's substandard compared to Goodfellas. I'd even say compared to Casino. I'd say it's in um, Scorsese's top 10, but it's not his best. I don't think it is as rewatchable. I watched it on a plane last year, and I was slightly disappointed by it. And you said, oh, the characters are so complicated. We knew Damon was a piece of shit and DiCaprio had his heart but in the right you place. Cared when you got it to caring about Damon, you actually cared. When you cared about DiCaprio, you actually cared. I never cared about anything in Goodfellas. See, he, and I, and I and love so De Niro, but that's just one character. Henry I, Hill. It, it, Goodfellas is so much more complex because Scorsese created this character, Henry Hill, who was a dirtbag, but you loved him. It was such an amazing anti-hero. So Nicholson for me. Nicholson you hated and loved simultaneously. Oh, and see. That was based off Whitey Bulger. Nicholson man, went a little phone in full, at the end oh, there. I didn't feel like you phoned in anything. I feel like every single actor in this was them at their prime, and it's full of A-list actors today. These actors starting here just ascended into the glory they are now, and without Scorsese's perfect direction. They were already editing, there. They oh, were I, already I, there. I Alec Baldwin, Mark Wahlberg. Ahead, I think that uh, The Departed, I agree with you, is a very rewatchable movie. I think it had an assist from Infernal Affairs, which was already a great movie. Yeah. The Departed is essentially a beat-for-beat beat remake of yep. that movie, and I love The Departed, but for me, I think that... I can't put it as high up in Scorsese's filmography because I feel like he had a big boost there and he had a lot to go on and a big head start. As far as Goodfellas goes, I think that that is one of a series of crime films that, that Scorsese does, and he does them well. I think that it's similar to Mean Streets. It's similar to Casino, which mm -hmm. I'm in the minority here. I like Casino a little better, personally, than Goodfellas. They're both great films. The Wolf of Wall Street is similar to it. He does this kind of, it's like kind of this montage form of editing where they have the, they have the popular music underneath it. It's a very similar style, and he does that style very well. And that style was created in Goodfellas, more or less. But I, Mean Streets, 
had a lot of style, very similar <laughs> to Goodfellas. Mean Streets was not as complex a film. I watched that recently. Uh, I'm not recently. saying it was as complex a yeah. film, but I'm saying that it was a crime film. It had the popular music. It had a lot of this. It had De Niro Don't forget playing. that Raging Bull borrows so much of what De Niro is known for. It's a New York story. It's Pesci and De Niro. It has but, so but, much but, of but what is, you're crediting not, my film for But it is for not having. at all like any other Scorsese film. It is not a crime film. It is a story about De Niro. It does De Niro and Pesci, the actors, but Pesci, first of all, absolutely brilliant in Raging Bull as the brother. He is, uh, that last scene where he walks up to him in the parking garage and he won't talk to him is amazing. But he's even better in Goodfellas. Goodfellas, talking, but, he's a portrait of talking, evil. Hell, I'm not talking about what's the best Pesci movie. Here's what I'm, I'm saying. Talking this about is the best Scorsese movie. If you want to say for a Pesci performance, I'm not it's going Pesci film. for Pesci. No, I'm this just this saying. is the best Scorsese film. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. why. That film is not is. as rewatchable. Raging well, Bull. Well, we're not judging rewatchability here. I, okay. Define. Saving Private Ryan is not as rewatchable as the departed that Define doesn't mean that the departed is a better film. criteria go into making a good movie. I think rewatchability, fine performances, good editing, good shooting, great direction. Thelma Shoemaker, her his longtime editor, the way Goodfellas is woven together, it's like none other Do you film. Wanna, that you want to talk before. editing? Let's talk about the editing in Raging Bull. The editing of those boxing scenes, boxing has not been portrayed in film as well. I'll as give it, it to you. I'll give that to you. One of the best Raging boxing Bull. movies. One of the best One of the boxing best movies. Edited movies. One of the best boxing time. movies of but all time. What, and it stands out from everything else that Martin Scorsese did because Goodfellas, as great as it is, I could put in there with Mean Streets and the other crime films along with The Departed. That's a simplification. Raging Bull, it's, that Raging shot, Bull stands alone there's not as one a movie shot, unlike anything talk. else that he made. That's what I think it is the best is because Scorsese was going outside of his comfort zone. He was telling the story, a different kind oh. of story than he was used to telling. Okay, how quickly, and then we're gonna let Koi chime. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I agree. Raging, you know, Raging Bull. Of of course, I, I'd be an idiot to say it's not a, a, a very, very good film. But Scorsese's talents as a filmmaker were at the height of its powers in Goodfellas. He took everything he'd learned, everything he'd known, the way it's woven together. I defy you, Dan, to tell me a sequence that beats that walking into the Copa, the walking into that club scene. One of the great moments in cinema history. On top of that... It's a Steadicam shot. People have been doing Steadicam shots for oh, years. Yeah. <laughs> that, Dan, I mean, it's a Steadicam oh, shot with Dan. a song underneath you it. Know, I'm sorry, it, Hal. It's it's not a sequence. It's it's a shot. People, they were running up the stairs with Rockies in the 70s The way with that was planned, choreographed, that is direction. Planning of a well, shot and choreography. Well, doing a whole boxing match is direction too, Hal, and they've never no, done it better than they did in, in Raging Bull. Well, there are some sequences in Rocky that I'll put, uh, I'll put up uh, against uh, some of the stuff in Raging Bull. But that being said, Goodfellas is is the seasoned Scorsese right. showing Coy, his stuff chime in the a best. Bit. I feel that when you speak of a director at the height of their power and getting to the point where wow. they combine he said it first, everything. Not either of you guys. Oh, no, I did. I just said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, refer I'm referencing That's your right. reference. Yeah. When you talk of a director in the height of their power, when you talk of a man who's at his A game, who's got everything he's learned put in one film, it is the power of caring about a single actor in a sports film and the ability to tell a crime saga in one film. I feel like The Departed is the combination of everything that led up to that point in Scorsese and the Academy agreed people agreed it did the best because it wasn't a Scorsese film that felt like a Scorsese film it was a movie that felt like a good movie it didn't feel like I a mean, crime film it didn't feel like Raging Bull it felt like a near perfect film that was beyond the genre of Scorsese because each and every actor in it had a full arc it was, each and every character in it was fully invested and everyone got to do their best work alright I'm going to at least give you one last closing statement sure this is it. Tell me why it's why the other two aren't as good. We're going to start with you, Hal, since okay. you've talked the most. Go oh. ahead, and then I'll let you two end up. The, the Departed is a good film, but it's in rewatching it, it's a little bit flawed. It's a little bit slow. It's derivative, as Dan said. It's a sh uh, almost shot for shot for infer or scene by scene for Infernal Affairs. Also, the the Oscars he got for that were. Borderline Lifetime Achievement Awards, the same way Pacino won over Denzel Washington. I think it was 91. Denzel Washington killed it in Malcolm X, and Pacino won for Sin of a Woman. It was a Lifetime Achievement Award. Dan, uh, that's a great nugget of a film. It's a gem, but it is not the behemoth masterpiece that is Goodfellas. That combines uh, the cinematography of, uh, I think it's Michael Bau Ballhouse, um, Thelma Shoemaker, his editor, all 
their very best. The performances, De Niro, Henry, uh, um, uh, Ray Liotta, Joe Pesci, that, the villainous Joe Pesci, oh my God, what are the most spine-tingling performances ever? Lorraine Bracco, an amazing film, Goodfellas, the most rewatchable film of all time, Scorsese's Dan. best. Dan's closing thoughts? I think that Goodfellas benefits from him riffing on what he'd done before in Mean Streets. I think that Goodfellas stood apart because that was the first time we'd seen him make that particular kind of film. I think he's made that kind of film several times since with Casino, with The Departed. I'm not saying it's a bad film. I'm saying what sets Raging Bull apart is that it is not only a fun watch and a good depiction of, of crime. It is a touching film. It is a human story. It really gets deep inside the life of this man, this tortured man, and it has something to to say it has something to say about humanity it has something to do about the strength of being able to look inside yourself and confront your own personal demons it is a personal movie it is a well-crafted movie it's more than a great watch i think it is his masterpiece cool you get to end out when I look at a film, I like to know that I care about everyone involved. When I watch Raging Bull, I care about one and a half characters. When I watch Goodfellas, I half care about many characters. When I watch The Departed, I care about both sides of a very specific coin. I care about the villain that's truly the villain in Nicholson. I care about two guys that are practically brothers in arms fighting opposite sides of the law. And I care about each and every cop in that bullpen. So I feel like when I go to see a film, if I want to be invested in every single character, I'd rather watch something that's like The Departed, which isn't just a crime film, which isn't just a sports film, which is the best <laughs> film Scorsese's ever made. All right. <sighs> Let that one go a little long just because wow, that was wait. intense. Joe. Uh, Twitter loved that one, and uh, we may have coined a new movie fights phrase, and I'm not going Pesci for Pesci. How <laughs> uh, about the fact that Hal only said high of his powers once? That was some serious <laughs> yeah. restraint, Hal. Yeah, no, you're, talking well. best. you're talking best and good fellas. I'm impressed you only got it in once. He's an evolving fighter, that Hal Rudnick. Thank you. Uh, Twitter uh, has a couple of other picks for uh, favorite films. Jeremy Hastings says uh, he loves Paging Bull with Roger De Niro. I see what you did there, buddy. Uh, 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 Solace Gollum says uh, Games of New York is a perfect movie. Nothing wrong with that movie. Games of New York? Gangs of New York. Oh, Sorry, did. misspoke. And uh, Ooh, uh, We can have a discussion about that. We, uh, <laughs> and we've actually got a lot of uh, love for Hugo with some of our younger viewers. That was their introduction Great movie. to uh, Scorsese. I liked Hugo. Uh, fun fact, uh, Larry McConkey, the guy who shot uh, Goodfellas, says uh, uh, that uh, that track, that uh, Steadicam shot, excuse me, was block lit and filmed before lunch in a half day. Wow. Wow. That is impressive. Damn. All right. Based on those arguments, there was one person who summed it up for me at one point, I think, very well. Uh, they queued up and kicked you out, Coy, when they sort of pointed out that uh, Infernal Affairs really did set up a lot of steps for him to be able to go from. Uh, and I just think it came down between Dan and Hal. But Dan, between ha getting that point out and a little bit more against Hal, I got to give Dan the point for Raging Bull. Good job. Scorsese, man. Mm -hmm. That was such a hard pitch. Yeah. If, you, if you haven't seen either of these three, any of these movies, yeah, go watch them. them. Raging right Bull now. is my second choice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very good. Very All right. Good. How did the, the poll go, Joe? Uh, Raging Bull actually at 17%, uh, <laughs> Goodfellas 48, and The Departed at 35. Wow. wow. There you go. They have, you got the older oldest, films. Once again, I take the oldest movie in the Twitter poll. <laughs> but a lot more Goodfellas love than I expected. Yeah, That's right? Great. Nice. Uh, All right. Here we go. Round three. Dan, you're up first this time. Yeah. And the question is now, have you noticed a trend? We just did worst, we did best, mm -hmm. now we're back to worst. Worst. What is the worst prequel of all time? Now, there's a lot of prequels you can pick. It's not just the prequels, as some might say. Right. Uh, so, uh, let's see what you say, Dan. Uh, well, I know it's not just the prequels, but I am going to go with one of the prequels. <laughs> Not the one that most people would say, though. I I'm going to go with the Star Wars Episode Two, hmm. Attack of the Clones. And the reason that I'm going to go with that is that I feel like, as you said, Andy, the prequels, as they are now, no, you just say the prequels, and people know what you're talking about. The prequels didn't become the prequels with Episode One, The Phantom Menace. It was Episode Two, Attack of the Clones, I contend, that actually sealed the fate of the Star Wars prequels. And the reason why is that I still contend that for all the bad things about The Phantom Menace, there were a number of good things that that movie did. A number of things that got people still not really on their heels so much until episode two. That movie undermined everything, everything that they were going for with these movies. That was the movie that cemented that this was in real trouble 
that was the movie that had the sand line, that had the line, one of my favorite lines, people give that sand line so much crap, but had the line, I'm haunted by the kiss that you never should have given me. That was where the lame love story <laughs> came from. That was where it really went wrong, and that's why I choose Attack of the Clones. All right, Hal, you're next. The worst prequel of all time is X-Men Origins The Wolverine. Mm. It is garbage. It almost it almost sunk the Wolverine uh, a, as a character that we'd want to see more often. Somehow they move past that. They're just like, eh, screw it. We'll just keep making more movies. And they turned out to be much better. But uh, it was a terrible movie. The... Uh, the characters they cast around Wolverine and the story they told around Wolverine uh, were very hard to watch and also a departure from what we'd already like seen from Wolverine in the X-Men movies and also it uh, had moments like uh, Will I Am <laughs> appearing in uh, an X-Men uh, movie and Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool in that movie gives us something to just look at with our jaws on the floor asking, oh my God, how could they do this to a beloved character? And thankfully, we've redeemed ourselves from that. It gave it so much that we had to come back from. The Wolverine made life harder for everyone. Koi? So I'm not going to lie, those are my first two choices. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go with the more standard choice, because I feel like I know it well enough, and say that episode one not only hurt Star Wars irreparably, but it actually hurt the people that watched it. Because up until episode one, there was hope. A new hope, if you will. And that going into that movie, people were broken. People watched those credits rolled and reimagined their childhood. Much like we discussed with Robert De Niro, when you see a bad performance, you go, man, did I actually love that? I feel like episode one was so bad that you looked back on your, like the 70s era Star Wars like, were those, was I just too young? Did I, am I a bad moviegoer? Episode one rewrote Star Wars history with Metachlorians. It reestablished Anakin as a pussy. It made you question everything you loved about the original trilogy. And it was boring. Somehow they made a movie about Star Wars with a 20 minute Padre sequence that was boring. That somehow introduced a Senate and Congress and all of these things that didn't need to be in there that were boring. And they had a lot of time to make this this movie. That movie was written and established and then happened and there's no excuse in it being as bad as it was with the amount of time and hope and potential that we could have had a real Star Wars trilogy, especially with the technology that had led up to that moment. There was no excuse for any of it. All right, we got Origins, Wolverine, Phantom Menace versus Attack of the Clones. Fight! I have, did you see the Phantom Menace in theaters? When I did. Out? What did you think of it? I, I was really young, and right. even in my youth, when everyone around me had that collective, <gasps> I was like, oh, this is what it's like to see your heroes die. It was like watching a rock star be a dick in public, where you're see, like, oh, I loved you until you were the asshole that I always knew you might be. That was not my experience. That was not my experience, because I'll tell you, with The Phantom Menace, again, you had Darth Maul. I didn't think that the pod race, when you saw it in the theaters, was as boring as people say it is. I think that so many negative things that are ascribed to the prequels, particularly episode one, came post episode two when the realization set in that the bad things that were in episode one, that was the rule. That wasn't the exception to it. It wasn't that we're going to get to this new stage in the story and it's going to get better. Liam Neeson is really good in episode one. Darth Maul is really good in episode one. The Obi-Wan, Liam Neeson, Darth Maul lightsaber fight is really good. The Duel of the Fates, the John Williams score is really good. There are some great things in episode one. I think there are zero great things in episode two. It ruined Boba Fett. It ruined Stormtroopers. It ruined Darth Vader. It ruined so many things. And it ruined episode three because it really handicapped everything that was going to happen in the next movie. As far as X-Men Origins Wolverine, I mean, you know, as Andy would say about this last one, th these are all bad movies. So, yeah. I, you know, I can't uh, say it's a good movie. I liked Leah Schreiber in it. I thought he was good as Sabretooth. I thought that there was some competent action in that movie. And regardless of what's surrounding him, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine Can't is always up. solid. And he, he's, he's, giving, he's doing his best. And he puts in a good, great Wolverine performance. He's great as the character. It's just and so much there around him. And there was a lot of solid working. acting um, in, the, uh, in uh, the Clone Wars. Uh, Attack of the Clones. Attack, Attack of the Clones, Attack of the Clones sorry. Um, and uh, it seems like you two are going Where, back who? and forth. Yeah, who? Can you... Be more specific. Who, who in Attack of the Clones would you say was exhibiting oh, uh, besides Ewan McGregor? Oh, I was just going to say Ewan McGregor. Okay. 
Okay, um, and, and Samuel L. Jackson, and I would argue no, the action. No. I would also argue the action in Attack of the Clones is superior, except for the one fight. Run Yoda. One. The, the there's battles. one. Yoda. There's no, one good the fight battles. in Episode One. Yeah, there's one good fight in Episode One. There are many good battles in Episode Two. Let me make a, Darth Maul gets Let me make a like major point. Minutes. I'd love to make a major point here. One reason why we look at these movies, the prequels, those three episodes, one through uh, three uh, movies, like we do, is because we inherently compare them to the original three <laughs> movies. Yes. Yes, that that taints us because de- uh, Andy, you know this. We all know this. There are just hordes of young people who hold these movies, the prequels, aloft as their Star Wars films, the films that they grew up on, and they don't understand all the noise that us haters who love the early movies are squawking about. And they even this is sacrilege, but say the early Star Wars movies are too slow. And these, so yeah, I don't agree with that. But there are people who love them, but we fall victim of comparing them. This. No. Movie. It killed Gambit. Okay. It had Will I Am in it. It had. De- it killed Deadpool for so long. There and are people that it, love this movie because they compare it to the original Hugh Jackman Wolverine. There are people that enjoy Wolverine performance in that, and I also think that that movie is a victim of the writer strike. There's no excuse for Star Wars being what it was. Thank you the for writer- uh, for that for that great point. This movie is a victim of the writer strike. Right, but well, that, that I'm, makes I'm, it worse. Yeah, that makes it a worse movie. Yes. No one was writing it. Right. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> but yes. I'm, these movies. Had Wait, which, a lot of time. No, this movie. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes but, but you said that, like having no writer. Like at least that's a cop out. That's a cop out that you can give to this movie. Right. It gets an out. It gets a little it gets asterisk. An out. No. It had the no. So that's movie, why it doesn't have any writers. That's this why it's garbage. garbage. And it's, it's if a, you're gonna talk, what's the worst of the worst? You got to get down to the nitty gritty. And at least yours potential. has. Well, it doesn't have writers, and ours had writers that worked for, for decades. Years. I don't decades on these. Yeah. I don't. Your argument doesn't compute. No writers equal bad movie. But no writers. It's what's the worst. Right, but your saying, argument I'm doesn't make sense. Your argument doesn't make sense. Well, your argument doesn't a make bad sense. Movie. So you're just repeating that my argument doesn't make sense instead of actually explaining why but my argument doesn't repeating. make sense. Okay, I'll explain it again. You, um, you're saying the movie had no writers. That makes for a shit film. It's what's the worst prequel. So thank I know, you but, for strengthening no, but I'm saying my that argument. it strengthens our argument because when we look at ours, we're saying these movies were so terrible. And to add to that, they had decades of work put into them. And, and they were mythology. still garbage. And also you, yours, you can at least say like well they did the best they could they didn't they have no any time writers. they just walked and in they, they filmed they some could. stuff these movies had every bit of potential they had every bit everyone wanted to work on star wars who wanted to work on that movie clearly will i am and that's it these people <laughs> wanted will to make a this delight. a delight why does everyone talk so much garbage about will he was i not am a delight because he was a delight i mean he's, he, had a, he had a nice he's hat. made some good he's, <laughs> He's he made some good, good music. Time. He doesn't belong in that movie. I love Liv Schreiber's saber tooth. Liv Schreiber, that opening credits with them. In oh, the, is that amazing? War. That opening That's a great sequence. Is a better sequence than anything. Anything in, episode in one. either one of these anything sequences. Anything in episode one. Better than yeah. the Darth Maul lightsaber fight. That was four, I don't that was think four so. minutes of them like dancing around, yes. all seeing lightsabers. No, Beautiful. I totally agree. It is memorable because it is a highlight of a shit film. It is a glorious moment that your feces drains from your mouth for a second. You go, oh, this could have been Star Wars. <laughs> that movie doesn't exist. All right, I've heard enough, Joe. Well, uh, we're talking prequels, so Twitter's got a lot of opinions. Um, uh, Tom Zambeno says, how about Minions? Which I echo. (laughs) Guys, Minions. You could have just shouted Minions over and over again. One fight. Uh, If I'm going to be honest, I I fought Wolverine and Minions before, so I just wanted (laughs) wanted something new, something fresh. (laughs) I had to to really dig deep on this. That's a good pull, Uh, Hamster pulled uh, Dumb and Dumber and Solus Golem ass. Does Pan count as a prequel? Yes. Because that sucked. Yes, it did. The Hobbit would have counted. Pan, a little more Jackman. I could have sworn you were going to go Hobbit. I, I, I was kind of hoping you would. I, 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 I gave it a lot of thought, but I thought, what well, was the worst one? And I went with uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine. Anything else, Joe? Uh, Fox Movies uh, issued an urgent SOS to the major agencies looking for a quick rewrite person to get the sh- script for Wolverine Origins into quick shape during the writer's strike, so that was yeah. absolutely impacted uh, because of the writer's strike. They had to, some non-union nobody had to write it in about four days to uh, get it ready in time to shoot. Uh, all right. Well, it was a very interesting fight. Very passionate. But both of you fell into a trap where you really did give Hal... It's a trap. <laughs> ...a very good point of admitting that without a, no script, no writers, that is a completely valid point to admit that his movie is worse. But we said that... We used that I, as a... I, yeah, we said I, that that's a cop-out. Because we had, had writers. writers and was worse. I was seeing if you were going to still fight me, Dan, because I wasn't... But I don't like that you're still fighting. Come on. I wasn't done. I wasn't done. Shush. Just wanted to piss you off a little bit. Because <laughs> I knew it would. That said, 
that said, uh, I think it came down to, it's not Phantom Menace. I think they both sort of got you with a little bit of too much good. And then I think Dan did point out a lot of good things about yours. So I got to give it to Dan. Yeah, third call in that round. I literally was like, I got one of these. Two. Oh, no. Uh, minions. Well, if you had minions, minions, minions been I think you might have won. Yeah. Oh. What have been <laughs> been I never <laughs> thought you'd say Wolverine because yeah. I, just, I just penciled you in for Hobbit as soon as I oh, had worse prequel. Oh, if you had prequel. Hobbit and then we had... Uh, <laughs> would would you have won Wolverine oh, then? That would have been a good Wolverine, fight. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Mm. What well, could have been? All right, we'll try uh, that in after I fight. I speed around Wolverine once and it was like... Yeah, that movie's just No, very, mind. very stellar argument. Sorry, I was trying to piss you off because I thought it might. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm a troll. Uh, I love that you bait me and then get on to me for <laughs> falling into your trap. Uh, but yeah, very intense. Uh, Joe, what the, what the poll say? Well, so I've only been here for a, a year, so I haven't seen a whole lot of things. But this is a crazy looking poll. Uh, 34% X-Men Origins Wolverine. 32% Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace. 34% Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the wow. Clones. Wow, pretty bad. Real wow. tight. That's That's really tight. tight. Nice. There you go. That was a fun fight. All right. In honor of Moana, which came out, there's a couple adorable sidekicks in that movie: the chicken, Pow Pow, the pig, and what's the chicken's name? Hi 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 hey 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 and Pow Pow. Uh, anyway, we thought, what? Let's have some fun. What is the best Disney animal sidekick? And sorry, who went first last time? Uh, I I did. Right? Yes, that's right. Yes, Hal, you're so back I'll, to first. Okay. Best Disney animal sidekick. You know what? The one I love the most, the one that resonates uh, it's in my mind, the one who's, who, I, who I sing, who I love to talk like, and is the most fun, Sebastian the Crab from The Little Mermaid. Sebastian is one of the most fun characters created by Disney. He was such an integral part to push the story along, um, such a great friend, and uh, had so many key plot points for The Little Mermaid. Sebastian the Crab uh, is Koi, my choice. let's just hear our options, and we'll do a bigger fight. Koi, okay. Pick. Uh, my pick is the only character that is actually a sidekick and assists the character in fighting and story, Mushu from Mulan. We haven't heard the Milan. third. That's true. Mushu. <laughs> Mushu from Milan. Mushu from Milan. Okay. Uh, Eddie Murphy, yes? Eddie Murphy. Okay. You can get a quick, quick state, opening statement. Oh, uh, the character not only fights, it is an emotional support, a physical support, a storyline support, and is a very fun character because it's Eddie Murphy when Eddie Murphy was killing it. Dan? I'm going all the way back, which means I'm going to lose the Twitter poll. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with the Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio. Oh, okay. Now, Dan, opening argument, and then you guys can all break in. I'm first? Yeah. Just, a, well, yeah, give me a uh, quick one. Yeah, I, no, I think that uh, when I was a kid, one of the very first movies I saw, of course I saw Little Mermaid, was, was Pinocchio. And why I always loved Jiminy Cricket was he wasn't just comic relief, and he wasn't just there to kind of help, uh, you know, just distract or be just something extra to this as a side character. He was... Was Pinocchio's guide and I like this thing of like he wasn't just the cute little thing hopping around behind him like he was literally his conscience and he tried to help he tried to push him he also as you're saying uh, with uh, Mushu uh, he was very integral to Pinocchio's success in that story he helped guide him to this journey he wanted to make him a better person and that's what I love about a sidekick is like it's not just somebody who's there it's somebody who is wants to help and who actually does help that character become a better person or puppet as the <laughs> cases with Pinocchio and I don't know he's got When You Wish Upon a Star which became Disney's like big that's their song now and I think that that all of the other animal sidekicks owe a lot to Jiminy Cricket because he kind of established what an ideal sidekick was which is like not just a cute little thing that's with the main character but a, a guide uh, a, a confidant and and really just somebody that can help and assist the main character and when you talk about that I, I think uh, Sebastian the Crab uh, along for the ride with the Little Mermaid uh, uh, really helped her in her evolution as this young girl who's so confused and uh, and is torn between being under the sea or going up to the land he was a, a trusted friend and a confidant Jiminy Cricket yeah of course he's classic he was like the first one, but I think he falls victim to, hey, the more you do it, the more interesting and uh, and complicated you can make these characters, the more fun you can have with these characters. I think Disney has done him better, has done one better, uh, has one-upped him several times since. And uh, you mentioned Eddie Murphy uh, was killing it. I don't know what you're talking about, because uh, Mulan was uh, in the 90s. Eddie Murphy was killing it in the 80s, maybe the early 90s. It reminded us of how much loved Eddie Murphy. You, it, was like um, an, it was the Norman you, era you about to come, so it was Eddie the, Murphy killing it in, in the movie, not in the time period. I mean, I guess in if you, the in his family-friendly zone, maybe, but he's better as a sidekick as Donkey. 
But, you know, that's oh, a better no. sidekick. I think Mushu kill Donkey. No, Donkey. I think Mushu, Mu, Donkey Don, better Don, sidekick. Much like Rock, uh, much like Robin in Batman, where he becomes Nightwing. I think Mushu is a character that is so great as a sidekick. You remember Mulan for Mushu, much like I said, Robin. This is a character who is not only a dragon, which is the best animal ever, but also this is an animal who protects Mulan while she's training and protects her identity. This is a character who fights alongside Mulan with the fireworks. This is a character who's an emotional support for Mulan. This is everything a sidekick needs to be is spiritual, emotional, physical, I, I and action-based. And I feel like I'm not going to be helped by a cricket in a fight. I'm not going to be helped by a crab. This is a dragon as a sidekick, and he's a great guy. I that's mean, everything I want. I, mean, I remember Mulan for the strong female protagonist, but that's just me. Uh, and um, Sebastian, um, he's got the... clearly Koi didn't. That was uh, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just said, he just love said love I remember Mulan for Mushu. Yeah, I'm just being... fighting I'm, for Mushu. Right, Flexing whatever. in action uh, shots. Uh, love. It's not like he disrespected our veterans. Huh? <laughs> Ladies, I respect a strong woman, if is what I'm trying to say. Okay, and and um, my uh, my character, best Disney sidekick. Uh, when you think about Disney, you think about the songs. He mentioned uh, When You Wish, uh, which is great. But um, Under the Sea and Kiss the Girl. Oh, my God. I can't think of a character that has two, especially a sidekick, that... Just, I could sing both of those for you right now. Andy, do you want me to? Nope. Just kiss the girl. <laughs> all right. I love all, the I, love, I we, actually love all three of these sidekicks, but why? Can we have some real talk about yeah. Sebastian real quick? Sure. I, I want to uh, hear why the other two. Why are the other ones not good? Uh, here's the thing about Sebastian. He's got a delight. He's got a couple of delightful songs. Oh, yeah, he does. And The Little Mermaid. But uh, Sebastian was a narc. Mm -hmm. Sebastian ratted Ariel out to King Triton at every chance. He told her the king where her little trove of, of human treasure was and he destroyed it and basically the only reason that Sebastian was with Ariel the whole time was because he was talking to King Triton and he was like teenagers suck and King Triton was like yeah they do you know what why don't you go hang out with my daughter all the time and keep an eye on her and he was like oh shit now I have to go do this he didn't even want to hang out with Ariel he, he was helped. there under duress you know what so Ariel needed someone to watch her back besides uh, you know, you know but while she was not, going but that's not a to her. Her. Is he, was he under duress what what was Sebastian under duress? Uh, what, what do you mean? Was he under duress? So he was in a. a, a, was he, a did, he want to be, did he want to be there? Yes, he wanted to be with Ariel. He was friends with Ariel. But then why did he run around all the time? He was he was more of a sidekick to the king because he, that was where he his was the king's was. composer. Yeah. He worked for the king. That was the loyalty was with the king. And so then yeah, he what's your reply to that? Yeah, I don't yeah, want to uh, gloss yeah, over that. It's a of, good point. Yeah, of course he was like he was like a nanny for Ariel. He was watching her, but at the end of the day, he was Ariel's like one of closest friends and confidants. Uh, you know, because his dad told him to be. I, mean, I don't know. I, well, I, I mean, like how you wind position. up there is how you wind up there. Uh, Mushu, Mushu, I think, is uh, a very funny sidekick. And, and, and I, I agree, Coy, that Eddie Murphy was, this was a reminder of like, oh, Eddie Murphy did a great voice. Remember it was pre, him? It was pre-Shrek. It, it was a great character. He's cute. But I think that, uh, I think Mulan could be Mulan without Mushu. I think Mushu is a very cute sidekick, and he added a lot of humor and comedy to that film. But I, I don't think he was instrumental in, ha in having Mulan be the person that she is. He may have helped in the fight, but Mulan was a great, strong character, and I think she could have found her way without Mushu. I think that when we're talking sidekicks, I think Jiminy Cricket is the best because he helps Pinocchio achieve his goals, he helps him achieve his dreams, and he helps him become the person that he wants to be. Uh, can I say one thing? Uh Go ahead, Ken, first. Go ahead, Cole. Okay. I think that when I want a sidekick, I want someone that isn't just a conscience, and I want someone that isn't just a nanny. I would rather have my sidekick have more versatility than just being a positive, because I'd like my sidekick to be along for the ride with me and give me opinions that are both good and bad, so I make my own decisions. And that's why I value Mushu over Jiminy Cricket, because he was independent of his own decisions, and he helped in so many different facets than just being a force of positivity. Because if, if I wanted that, I would just rely on my conscience. And I feel like with... I just never felt like I trusted Sebastian, and I always felt like he was like kind of a weird, sketchy side version of a character that I wouldn't really rely on, and therefore that's much like it's the opposite. So conscience and demon on your shoulder, like those are two things I don't want. Mushu was his own man, and he was a dragon. His Go own ahead, man. okay. Um, <laughs> I, hey, I hate to say it, but Jiminy Cricket is a punk ass bitch. <laughs> Yeah, I said it. Okay, all the all the all the motherfuckers that we're talking about. Okay, flying solo. Jiminy Cricket needs the help of the magic of Tinkerbell. He can't even pull it off by himself. First of all, Tinkerbell's in Peter Pan. Yeah. What? <laughs> Do you guys need me to fact check that? If you're referring that? to the Blue Fairy, the Blue Fairy. 
<laughs> Tinkerbell just wanders into the wrong movie like, oh, shit. There was a fairy, yes, yes. blue fairy. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll allow it. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and Mushu, listen, I, w- I went to Peking Garden the other night and had some bad Mushu chicken that gave me diarrhea. Okay? Oh, the worst. I don't yep, think Mushu's responsible for your so, diarrhea. So, I'm going to count out Mushu. But, uh, All right, the, Hal, you're out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> Denying I mean, my diarrhea. You, you, you were, I'm, uh, I've heard enough. <laughs> I, I appreciate Mushu the effort, oh, but wow. I think the, they uh, they narked you out on that one. And, uh, as much as Sebastian is one of my favorite characters, he really Listen, is kind of a jerk. I saw a version where uh, Tinkerbell where, where Tinker Bell was there, Peter Pan was there, Pinocchio was there, Baloo, well, Baloo. Baloo was All there. Right. Uh, so it came down to Mushu and Jiminy Cricket. So I was listening very closely. Um, I liked your argument of it didn't need uh, Dan. You, that, Mulan sort of doesn't need Mushu, uh, but then I really liked Koi's argument about the conscience, uh, and you know, um, or an Annie minds its own person and versatile and gets its its, its sort of own thing. I, I I I don't love Mushu that much, but I get what you were saying, and I think it's a valid point. It's he offers a little bit more than just the conscience, and is also in a way the conscience. So good fight there, Koi. Koi's on the board. Mm, yes. All right. So, Jiminy Cricket is a punk-ass. <laughs> 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 that might have been a moment, <laughs> that that been one of the, a moment for the next round. <laughs> wow. What a great show. I never <laughs> thought I would hear that sentence in my life. <laughs> We're making moments here on this episode. All right, here we go. Number five. This is an epic one. This is a lot of fun. Um, uh, here we go. What? Uh, here we go. Uh, worst comic book movie. There's a lot to pick from. This is an epic question. We've never actually done this. I was surprised. Wow. What is the worst comic book movie? Who do we start with? I think Koi. Koi. So I I like. Can we just get your movies out first? You, I, I think, think we started. We start, uh, with, we start you. with me. So now it's Koi's turn. Okay. So no yeah. intro. Just movie. just tell me your movie. Oh, I, know I, want, I want to know how we're all going to fight this. Yeah, it's a great section. Uh, 2015's Fantastic Four. Okay. Mm. <laughs> we got Fantastic Four, Dan. That's a good one. This might be a controversial choice. Tell me if this counts. If there's if there's too much, can, I, I would like to say Dragon Ball Evolution. That's manga. Is that manga. A comic? Does that does that count or Joe? no? I mean, if you count Japanese culture and literature as comic books, do, are can, we supposed to? If you want me to not, I can go with something else. <laughs> like another, I don't know. I'm just asking. We can stay uh, Joe, in the more traditional I'd, I'd give, comics I'd, if you want. I, I'd give it. I don't want there to be controversy here, but. Is that, it a comic book? My mind. I, it's a I manga. consider a manga a comic book. It's, it's just backwards manga, and black a comic and book. Yeah. I don't. Do you want to win on a technicality? <laughs> I, I, fine. I'll, 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 go with more, <laughs> I'll go with the more conventional choice. Fine. <laughs> I will say Superman for the Quest for Peace. Okay. Just a movie no one seen. So we're like, yeah, Dragon Ball Evolution. Halle Berry's Catwoman. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic Four, Catwoman, and Superman Quest for Peace. Okay. Wait, JT. There's a typo on there. Uh, what? There's a typo. Can you fix that? What is the uh, best comic book movie? Oh. We are introducing a new new segment called trick the question. Trick Question. <laughs> no, that's not a trick question. That's a lie. It's just, <laughs> just a betrayal. Uh, that's a betrayal is what that is. Right. <laughs> Good job thinking for nothing, nerds. Yeah. That's what that question is. Just right oh, so room. here we go. Okay. This is now a new format we just came up with that I'm very excited about called The Trick Question. Now that you've all played your cards and told me the worst comic book movie, you must defend it as the best. No. Oh, this oh is, mother of God. Oh, is, wait, no. So we have to take our answers and, and defend say it as the that best it's the best. Movie? Oh, yes. this, this would have been a great oh. round to be contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So now you must defend your comic book movie. This is a tr- three fighters, awesome fighters. you got to prove your worth here. Okay. Tell me why yours now is the best. <sighs> Dan, why is Superman 4 the Quest for Beast the best? Koi, why is Fantastic 4 the best? And Hal, why is Catwoman the best? Now I will give you one bit of advice before this fight starts. If you give in and give me bad qualities about your film, yeah. that's thrown in the towel, and I will consider that failure. Mm-hmm. You love this movie. Yeah. We clear? Okay? All, in fact, all three of these are great movies, right? In some regard, just like you've mm-hmm. been treating the Scorsese fight. Treat this like it's the Scorsese fight. All right, here we go. Best comic book movie, Koi. Why is Fantastic Four the best comic book movie? 
2015's Fantastic Four fixed everything they did wrong in the original two Fantastic Fours Fox tried to make. They finally listened to the fans and they gave us a Sue Storm we cared about. They gave us a Mr. Fantastic that uses powers in creative ways. They gave us a thing that actually said it's clobber in time that really you felt for and you were invested in. They gave us an amazing Human Torch in Michael B. Jordan that not only was charismatic and charming and you felt like it actually did the action, but he was endearing. He was Johnny Storm. Every time Johnny Storm was on screen, that's a person you wanted to follow, you wanted to be friends with, you wanted to have a beer with. F Mr. Fantastic seemed intelligent, seemed like he could actually get his way through things, and it gave us a Dr. Storm that we'd never seen before. It gave us action unlike anything we'd ever have, and it gave us deep cut comic references with the negative zone, and with the Fantastic Car being referenced. It gave us so many things we never thought we'd seen, and it almost gave us hope for Fox having a credible Fantastic Four to go along with their X-Men and giving us a challenge to Marvel. It was so good, it gave us potential to have a rival to Marvel Cinematic Universe in Fox's Fantastic Four that could team up with the X-Men, and it was set in a universe that felt like the X-Men could be involved, and it was brilliant. Wow. Dan. Counter arguments, I assume, are later. <clears throat> okay. Let's see your opening Superman arguments. Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. First of all, is there any more American, just not even American, he's a citizen of the world, hero, than Superman? He's an icon of hope, and the name of the movie and Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. And how many of these, what do we give all of these superhero movies so much crap for these days? They're dark and depressing and it's all about fighting and verses and how much everybody's at each other's throats. This is a story about Superman trying to achieve world peace. This is a story about Superman on behalf of humanity saying, as a citizen of the world, I am going to take steps to ensure that you will not be able to destroy it, that you will have to work out your conflicts as human beings, as, as citizens of the earth. And he's standing up against someone who's literally himself that Lex Luthor is manufacturing as the opposite of him. And at the end of this movie, he still stands tall. And the world, by the way, is has no nuclear weapons, is a world at peace. Superman brings peace to the world. What is a bigger superhero action than bringing peace to the planet Earth? Hal, Catwoman, why is it the best? Catwoman is the best superhero film of all time. Halle Berry coming off an Academy Award for Monsters Ball. Wow. I mean, in a towering performance, a complete change of pace. We saw one speed in Monsters Ball. Make me feel good! And then she she drove a superhero genre film like no woman save no actor has ever done before and have we ever met a more diabolical villain than Sharon Stone oh when when she stepped on the screen i mean before I mean, it brings to mind, I wonder if Heath Ledger watched Sharon Stone to prepare for his Joker later in The Dark Knight. It was directed by a Frenchman, and you can see um, the influence <laughs> of French cinema. French French his, his name, he goes by one name. It's Pitoff. Pitoff. It was directed by Pitoff, and Pitoff is a student of Godard. He's a student of the French New Wave, and you can see that he crafted a cinematic gem <laughs> Like, the likes of which we'd never seen. I could keep going about Catwoman. <laughs> she is a tertiary character in Batman's rogues gallery, but she is turned into a beautiful anti-hero by Halle Berry. So not only, like you guys are like talking about uh, stuff we've seen before from Superman, this changes the game, changes the game. Gives us a side of Catwoman that we had yet to see. All right, guys, fight it out. Not only isn't Halle Berry the best superhero, she's not the best Catwoman. I would put her behind Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer Lee Merriweather, Julie Newmar, Eartha Kitt, whoever voiced Catwoman in the Batman animated series. I call them My girlfriend has stones. a cat named Muffin, who if you put are a you mask on would be a better Catwoman than Halle Berry was now, in I'm that movie. Now, I'm not saying neither of your movies uh, are memorable, but my movie is far and away the most memorable of I these films. This so. movie has so much heart that you're like, man, after Chronicle, it makes sense for Josh Trank to go to Fantastic Four. I'm glad he already established how good he was at directing action and superheroes, that he was ready to establish an entirely new franchise in the Fox universe. Superman didn't do anything. He, in the first 
Superman. Superman, Superman to believe, cure humanity. Don't believe a man can fly was the catchline of the first film. By the fourth film, we no longer believed he could fly because he oh, barely flew in that gentlemen. film. He flew into there was space. Nothing that he happened fought in, that in film. space. Catwoman. He carried the Statue of Liberty. In midair, how what more heroic thing? He literally Just flew in the air that, with the Statue of Liberty. Thirty years or ten years after the first film, I no longer believe in the CGI that should have been more advanced. Gentlemen, to that point. I didn't believe a man could fly. Both of your films are fucking garbage. Okay, <laughs> Superman: Quest for Peace, the worst special effects maybe of any film of all time. And when it's a big, when it, when it's a superhero film, that's problematic. That that one of the worst villains of all time. Those claws laughable so much wrong so phoned in so poorly done um, it, it breaks my heart that that was Christopher Reeve's last Superman and um, with Fantastic Four oh man Josh Trank had a vision they wouldn't let him do it and the ending of that movie it's like show up we got one green screen day we'll shoot the ending garbage no, I, I, the only one of these movies that has a sequel in production is mine that is not true there is no Fantastic sequel to Fantastic Four, Four 2 is in production still happening no, as far they as haven't erased they, it off the chalkboard at Fox yet. There That's was a never difference a between that and it's still 2, happening. And there was never a chalkboard for a sequel to Superman I guarantee you so that there was. now mine is the one that clearly was the best because it well, has a sequel. First of all, Hal can't franchise. attack my character, so he attacks my film's budget. That is not fair. And I will say this about both of our movies. It has no basketball scene, as your movie does, Ooh, Hal. One of the worst scenes in any movie ever. for bringing that the up. Catwoman basketball Matt, scene. we showed a whole other side. It was... You know what? Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna say this right now. It's better than Teen Wolf as far as basketball. Oh, a that surprise. is heresy. Oh, it's beautiful. That it's is beautiful. heresy. There's no oh. better basketball scene in any film, sport, or otherwise than Teen Wolf's basketball Except scene. Except Halle Berry as Catwoman. <laughs> do, 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 Halle do, Berry's sweet Catwoman is so, Halle Berry. so not I wish memorable. the Harlem Goldtrotters had been in that scene. It would have made it possibly bearable. Your movie, if I was gonna pick a movie that was everything wrong with superhero oh. movies, it's Fantastic Four. Oh my a god, the most family. Casting against I, oh. types so we can actually have an interracial family, changing the dynamic of the team to make it more I don't care about the casting. I wanted to go sit in a dark room alone for six hours after that movie that, was over. It was that so movie depressing. Was so ahead of its time, it I, recast a character, established this white with a, the better African American choice because he was Johnny Storm. And they it still us, wasted it. It gave us a young Miles Teller as Mr. <laughs> Fantastic because it would have been easier to cast a Mr. Fantastic. That was the more standard issue. I've and never sympathized with J.K. Simmons I'm more than watching I'm Fantastic Four. The thing I'm dropping out of the, air, uh, the airplane to fight was like such an ingenious choice. That wasn't choice even the movie. To, to that was only in the trailers. No, was that the was not in your movie. movie. Was I'm no, shocked. It was, it was coming out of the movie. The it tanks. was only in the trailers. That, I am that was shocked. the thing I've always wanted. I'm shocked and saddened that neither of you gentlemen have mentioned the beautiful heart and soul of Catwoman. It doesn't exist. Oh, I'm about to tell you. I'm about to tell you. Halle Berry is a graphic designer for an evil cosmetics company, and she comes across their horrific plan. And Halle Berry, it's a strong statement for women Sister empowering each other. No, woman. I'm talking about the entire story of the film. It's a story about women empowering themselves and not being beholden to the beauty industry and certain standards of beauty. What is Catwoman's name in that movie? What is oh Halle Berry's character's name? Yeah. Uh, that escapes me at the moment, but I love it. And on That's my next rewatch, that That's no. how memorable that film is. That's how memorable that film is. Now my character has a strong well, female okay. lead, well, well, and my film has a Sue Storm that is credible, likable, and keeps up with Reed Richards. It shows an entire family of characters just, better than your character that doesn't even have a just name. Just because I don't your remember, your film is a fourth film in a series where we'd already given up on everyone. That's Mine not starts true. an entire my franchise. My film is about hope. It is about brightness. It is about Superman saving the world, which he does at the end. It is about standing up to the evils. Mine nuclear is about power, which family. not nuclear power, but nuclear uh, 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 bombs, which was an enormous, massive thing still in the 1980s when the Cold War was still going on. He brought God. peace to the Earth, something no other superhero has been able Patience. to do. Halle Berry's character is named Patience. There you go. <laughs> My film is about a family who bonds together, and it shows us what it means to be a superpowered family in a way unlike, the, I mean, I'd say more a, than The Incredibles did. A film this by a beautiful show. These every are ridiculous claims. Every character in that film is fleshed out. A I film, stand okay. by every claim I make about Superman. Superman for the quest for Final peace. thoughts, Dan. These guys are both saying like, well, you know, they do this, they do this. I'm saying this is what's the best superhero movie ever. What is a superhero in essence about? A superhero is about peace and hope and humanity and being a beacon of light. And that is what Superman is in Superman 4, the quest for peace peace. He takes on his greatest enemy, he defeats him, and he leaves the world a better place. 
Catwoman doesn't leave the world a better place. Yes, she does. The Fantastic Four, like half the <clears> world <throat> gets ripped up into whatever trash hole circle that was in the third act. I don't even know what that was. At the end of Superman 4, Superman glides across the face of the planet Earth and looks down at the peace that he has given the world. I can't think of a greater superhero deed than what he accomplishes in that movie. How? I imagine Pitoff, a young boy growing up on the south of France saying, I want to give something to humanity. And he did. It's called Catwoman. It's a story that empowers women. It takes this character who's only a side dish in so many movies and TV shows and makes her the entree. Halle Berry, a beautiful follow-up to her Oscar-winning performance. I'm surprised she didn't go Tom Hanks and go back to back. And Sharon Stone, an epic villain. The, the story has a soul and a heart. Dan, um, the, yours is the worst of of the four Superman movies and Not it's true. laughable. Not Yours true. is a big mistake, that movie. Um, Josh tried to, tried to do something, they took it away from him and then tacked on an ending, ending up with a, a dumpster fire. Coy, last thoughts? Now, the question isn't who's the best superhero because you described what makes a good superhero. The question isn't who has the most Oscars. The question is what is the best superhero movie? Hmm. What do you go into a superhero movie for? You go in to have Easter eggs that reference comics references that you don't think you'll see. You go in for action. You go in for character development. You go in for family. This movie has action set pieces out the wazoo. This movie has the characters doing stuff we haven't seen them do in anything but the comics. This movie has entire set pieces set in the negative zone, a thing that up until 2015 we never thought we'd get to see. This movie has Doctor Doom. This movie has everything you want in a cinematic masterpiece. And a comic book movie needs those things. Neither of yours had them. I don't care about the Oscars. I don't care about Superman. This movie oh, was oh, a oh. superhero film, and it is the best of them. Oh, man, that was intense. Joe, what are they saying on the boards? So, uh, I mean, according to Twitter here, uh, for what they love, the trick question. That, that blew a lot of minds. Uh, but according to Twitter, how <laughs> Hal and Dan brought knives to a coy gunfight. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, just a few things to cover here. Uh, Catwoman's name in this movie is Patience Phillips. Hal did pull it, yeah. Um, this is Pitoff's only feature. <laughs> uh, he is One the special. He is the visual effects uh, director for such films as Alien Resurrection, and um, that's about it. And Delicatessen. <laughs> Uh, Fantastic Four uh, 2 is off the release calendar. Uh, they, they did pull that box office mojo was the first company to report that. That is no longer on any whiteboards. Who, based on the arguments. Uh, <laughs> uh, man, this is really tough. Hal, you had some serious passion there. I, I mean, high marks the whole way. And it's not, a, I, I'm still deciding. It's in my head because I think if I got to pick one on passion, you got you got it there. Uh, but then, Coy, you did you did make a good point that Dan's really talking about the hero more than the movie, which is a val valid valid counter argument to him because he is oh he leaves it's all about peace, but not really about the movie, more about the character trait. So, so that's what the movie's about. That was a good knock there. Uh, so it really it does come down to Hal and Coy. Uh, Dan, you're already in, so it doesn't even matter. Uh, but between Hal and Coy, and based on those arguments, do I? There was some passion coming from Coy too. Action, we got to see the negative zone, you made a good point. Uh, uh, the interracial family, <laughs> Dr. St Storm, how it fixed everything. You got the clobbering line in. Uh, diabolical Sharon Stone, on the other hand, could have could have motivated Heath Ledger. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I mean Best ever. <laughs> and and your your just the, the thought process of Pitoff uh, and his French New Wave style. <laughs> Shared X-Men universe. <laughs> All the action set pieces. Oh man, this is rough. Do I go for the funny or do I go for the better argument, Joe? What do you think? I mean, sometimes. Is that a question? <laughs> <laughs> In this instance, it's kind of hard because it's a trick question. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if any word just sums up this round, it's wolf. But, um, I've got to go. I've got to go substance over style here. I got to go coy. Yeah, I got to give props though to Hal, and you almost won me over just on the your because it is a creativity, and I, I it's more of a creative comedy choices there. But I got to give coy substance a little bit more. Uh, so Koi gets the points. Woo!
that was the hardest fight of my entire movie okay. fight Bravo. career. Oh, that, that a round of applause for Hal, and I wish I could take yeah. you to the end just for Boy. that passion there. Wow. Not wow. laughing also, the I did also, thing I did also so see hard. you cheat to look up the names. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew it! <laughs> If you hadn't have done that, I might have swayed me. Uh, so, Koi, uh, th that's it. You made it the fi- Uh-oh. Yeah, look uh -oh. at this. Tied up, too. The fans have been wanting this. Speed round. The Champ Merle going up against Koi, mm. the, the Micro Machines man. He's got the advantage here, I think. Stay tuned after the speed Marvel round fans, for some fun uh, facts on some upcoming fights. But here we go. Uh, you guys know how this works. Let's get straight to it. It's a long episode. I don't need to explain how the speed round works. Uh, I will need you to help time it. Do you have a bell? Do we have another bell for Joe over there to help? Uh, Joe, you ready on the counter? I'm ready. Here, these are these are tough ones. Mm. We did not uh, skimp. Andy, we're twenty and ten. Okay. Twenty and ten. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Yes, twenty and ten. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, base. Did we get a poll on that last question? Uh, we did let me bring it I'm up. Just curious, what um, was the best? Uh, fan four stick. One, it, okay. But didn't run away with it. Superman uh, Quest for Peace was pretty close, followed by Halle Berry's Magnum Opus. <laughs> well, trick question. We'll talk, I'm, I'm in love with that. We'll be doing so that again good. someday. We'll Keep talk off. about it after the fight. Keep All right, off. here we go. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Round one is a bargain bin. Uh, I don't know who submitted it. We'll find out in a second, but I'm going to show you two uh, movies, and you have to tell us which one should we buy. Let's hold on. Let's make this a Black Friday themed. It's, it's on sale oh. on Black Friday. Okay. Okay. And Black they're both Friday. the same price. Which one? But I can only afford one. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which one should I buy? All right, here we go. Resurgence, Independence Day. I'll take Alice. <laughs> Said <in> such disdain. <laughs> okay, we got Resurgence versus Looking Glass. All right, and uh, Dan, you spoke first. So that means you'll begin, and the time will start when you begin speaking. Independence Day Resurgence is a flawed movie, but it's still a follow-up to a much beloved movie. And I will say that for everything that's not good about Independence Day Resurgence, there are things to love. It widens the scope of the aliens. It has a bigger alien presence. You still like Jeff Goldblum. He's still a fun character. You still have characters that you enjoy in this movie. Alice Through the Looking Glass is a retread of a movie that was already terrible. That was 20. Wow, that goes fast. All right, Koi. Alice Through the Looking Glass is a visual masterpiece of experiencing a movie that is only based on visuals. It didn't have to be as intelligent as Independence Day Resurgence was because Independence Day Resurgence is a sequel to a great film. Alice in Wonderland was exactly what it was meant to be, which is a visual thing explaining a movie that is all about a drug trip, and that's what the movie was. It didn't betray the first one because the first one didn't have a lot to go on. This movie is what it was meant to be. Ten seconds, Dan. The problem is that the visuals that they're working on are garbage. It looks like you ran uh, Wonderland through the mud. It's awful. It's unpleasant to look at. The first one was. This one was. Independence Day, there's still some fun to be had. Ten seconds when you begin speaking, Koi. Independence Day 2 is so bad it makes you doubt the first one's presidential speech. It's one of the best speeches of all time. It is so bad it knocks down the first a peg. Alice in Wonderland is just a C-, minus, which is what the first one was, and that had no bar to be set. Independence Day 2 hurts the first. Woo, Hal, coming to you, man. Now you have to um, help decide this based this, on this, arguments. This, this was an easy one for me. I felt like Dan um, just had so many um, positive points about his movie, and uh, Koi uh, hung his argument on the visual style, and it's like, if I'm going to buy it, do I want to buy that? Maybe if I want to, like, you know, take a, like, get high or something to watch, but <laughs> yeah. Which you didn't Dan, say. Yeah, Dan uh, Joe, Dan are you with it. us? Yeah, you know, the, the one big argument was the visual style, and Dan threw that Hadouken of uh, the visuals were awful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, great. All right, Dan, you get the first point. Here we go. Number two. Ooh. Best movie facial hair. <laughs> Best movie facial hair? Ooh. Lon's been pushing for this one for a while. I bet, well, he would. Best. Tony Stark. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Oh. Best movie facial hair. <laughs> so many places to go. Uh, I'm gonna go with. Uh... Oh wow. Uh, let's go with Hans Gruber in Die Hard. Ooh. Did you have one, Hal? Did you want to make a joke? Oh, no, I was going to say, it should have been sponsored by Movember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I asked. <laughs> I love you, though. Uh, all right, Koi, you got out Tony Stark first. Uh, you have 20 seconds. 
Tony Stark's facial hair is so good, it explains everything he is as a person. It is coiffed, it is manicured, it is beautiful. It's a reference to the comics. It shows how manicured and focused he is. It shows that he is arrogant. It shows that he is charismatic. It shows everything you need to know visually about a character that didn't need that, but it also references a comic which makes fans happy. It makes new viewers happy. It makes everyone watching the experience happy because it explains so much while doing so little. Damn. Hans Gruber's beard is the optimum length of any movie beard ever. It is not short enough to be stubble, as if you're some kind of a European gangster. It is not long enough to look like he doesn't have his sorts. It is the exact right, right length. It is the beard of a man who knows what he's doing. Guy Fieri, Smash Mouth, I've seen a lot of people with that Tony Stark facial hair. Hans Gruber has the best beard in any movie ever. All right, Koi's follow-up. <laughs> When I look at Hans Gruber's facial hair, it doesn't tell me who he is as a person. When I look at Tony Stark's, I know. When I'm invested in a character, the level I need to be at Tony Stark or Hans Gruber, I need something that is manicured and fit and perfect, and I don't feel Hans was, it feels a little lazy. Damn. When I look at Tony Stark's beard, I think singer of a ni late 90s terrible alt-rock band. When I look at Hans Gruber's beard, I think European. I think <laughs> suave and sophisticated. Okay, that's tough, Joe. A uh, uh, facial hair man, fellow fellow facial hair man. So look, uh, I think that that was that was the coy people have been uh, wanting to come out shooting. He, he wasn't there in round one, but he uh, sure but showed holy, up in round two. But but speed be damned, that Guy Fieri. Oh, that was that Guy Fieri Smash Mouth counter. I'm giving this to Dan. He's an all star. Wow, I wow. still gotta go with Koi. I thought, oh, uh, uh you know, Koi, you're not gonna go to me too? No, I'm gonna, I'm just saying first, then you're, you can help be the tiebreaker. Hell, oh, Jesus. Right. I, I gotta say Koi, <laughs> that was a funny joke, but I still think Koi got more in. Uh, Tao, what are you, what are you saying? Dan's first round argument was so bad. It was <laughs> amazing. It was great comedy. Just saying, it w that's a well-groomed beard. Um, Koi had an onslaught. And I'm not saying I completely agree with it, but he passionate and he backed it up and how the uh, Tony Stark's facial hair related to the comics. It um, defined and explained some of the character. Koi won it easy for me. All right, Koi gets the next point. Okay. That there is the speed but imagine Dan, Hans Gruber without that beard. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I thought <laughs> of the one. same guy. Sam Elliott's mustache yeah. in oh, um, Big Lebowski. In everything. Yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Now, for the rest of your life, you could only watch one of these actors' movies. <clears throat> you mm -hmm. could only watch their filmography. Yep. For the rest of your life, who would you pick? Mm -hmm. Keanu Reeves or Matt Damon? Keanu Reeves. All right, you got Matt Damon. Koi, he's thinking. He's like, all right, okay. what does that mean? Yep. <clears throat> Keanu, we thought about this. We had a fight in the office. Uh, <laughs> try and make sure this is fair. Wow, wow, wow. All right, uh, so question. Dan, you're first. Keanu Reeves, why would you pick his filmography for the rest of your life? If I'm watching a movies, a character's, an actor's movies for the rest of my life, I'm going to go with the guy that brought me Speed, the guy that brought me Point Break, the guy that brought me The Matrix, the guy that brought me Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I'm going to go with the guy that entertains me, that provides me with a consistently exciting filmography from Bill and Ted to John Wick. Keanu has been bringing it. All right, Coy. Time starts and you begin speaking. When I watch a film, I want to be invested in the character more than just the action. I feel like Keanu Reeves is a great actor, but he just does action really well. Matt Damon's Good Will Hunting, Matt Damon's uh, Talented Mr. Ripley. Matt Damon brings such nuance. I could rediscover stuff each time I watch it, and I have all the Ocean's films if I want to just have an action film. I have so many more layers with Matt Damon that I could get with Keanu Reeves that I could rewatch everything and find new elements each time, whereas Keanu Reeves had to get a very specific note. Uh, okay, Dan? Matt Damon is tortured. Goodwill Hunting, uh, Talented Mr. Ripley, All the Pretty Horses. Oh, three Borns, three Oceans movies. Keanu Reeves is action. It's excitement. It is thrills. It is what I want to enjoy. Koi, last thought. To counteract all of his torture, he also has, as I said, the Bourne films, the Ocean films, those films that are action packed where you get the pathos and the action of Keanu, but with more acting credibility. You get everything from Keanu, but more. Whoo! Hal, back to you. Oh, gosh. Based wow. on the arguments. Both very good. Both very good. Damn it. I don't want to choose. <laughs> um, do you wow. want me to go to Joe first? Joe, do you have an, yeah. opinion, have an opinion? Yeah, I I loved where Dan was going and the point he was trying to get to, but he he 
didn't quite hit it hard enough for me. I got to go with Koi on this one. You know what? I'll go with Dan and leave it up to you, Andy. Because <laughs> <laughs> they both had excellent arguments. I mean, yeah. oh, and they're both so different. I was I listening. I was tr- I mean, one of the easiest ways to do it was just who could list the best movies. And I feel like you, you actually had a watch there. You both did a good job with that. Uh, but yeah, I didn't hear much more for Dan aside from it's action, it's action, which I think he does have more. And, and because Koi was able to show the range, I gotta give it to Koi. Mm. So Koi's ahead. We got two more questions, or one more. Yeah, unless he unless you lose this one, Dan, this could be it. Yeah, this could be it for you. It's all yes, over. It could be. Good thing you didn't put the belt on then, huh? Yeah. Chickened out. I'm just <laughs> sorry. I'm not trying to psych you out. It's more I mean, trolling Dan. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. Dan's a pro. Dan, I mean, Dan could crush him right now because he's the best. Here we go. He's a veteran. <laughs> sorry. Round four. What movie is most improved by a second viewing? Fight Club. The Sixth Sense. Ooh, Fight Club versus Six Sense. You're up first, Koi, with Fight Club. Time starts when you begin speaking. Fight Club is the same type of twist as Six Sense, where when you watch it the second time, you get to experience it differently, but it also has more layers of nuance. You get to see those flashes of Tyler Durden, they make more sense. You get to see all the little interests, intricacies of him like hitting the car and having it be him first. You get to see people watching Tyler Durden and knowing it's an area. You get to experience it through different eyes with the second version of the film that you wouldn't get in the first film. It's not just one person carrying, it's the entire supporting cast knows something that we don't know. Dan, God, you got a lot of words out there. Someone count them. <laughs> Dan, uh, time starts and you begin speaking. They both have twists. I think that Fight Club is essentially the same film on the second viewing. You just happen to know that Tyler Durden is a second person. It's the same interaction between the characters. Sixth Sense is a different film when you know that Bruce Willis is not physically present in some scenes. Scenes play differently, completely differently. You see how intricately that film was put together to hide that twist from you. Fight Club pulls the rug out from under you, but Sixth Sense... 10 seconds. I couldn't disagree more. They have the exact same twist and all the interests because these are in my film that are in yours, but you have more of a supporting cast that are reacting to it instead of just the little boy. They're the same twist, the same second viewing, but there's more to experience in the second viewing. 10 seconds, Dan. Fight Club telegraphs that twist with all them saying, I felt like I was fighting myself. Sixth Sense completely pulls the wool over your eyes and it is a completely different movie when you see it with the new perspective the second time. I'm gonna give him 10 more seconds. Koi, 10 seconds, go. There are more subtle hits to mine, I totally agree, but they are all more invested in the twist, whereas yours is just little little spots. This movie changes the second viewing because you care about the twist more. You're more... 10 seconds, Dan. The events of the movie play out the same way the second time with yours. The events of The Sixth Sense play out completely differently because the character's motivations change completely on a second viewing. You read more into Haley Joel Osment's character. All right, I just wanted to make sure I heard their arguments because they did repeat themselves a bit, but they gave a little bit more color. So, uh, Joe, based on those arguments... Based on those arguments, uh, Dan hit us with technicality, how the movie is laid out, and Kois really started to have to lean into it. Makes you feel, which is very subjective. So I've got, I've got to go, with Dan. Hal. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan had it uh, for me. Uh, I'm not saying uh, I uh, like both their choices, but uh, Dan uh, made it uh, the more impactful viewing experience. Yeah, I'm with it. So Dan, you're back in. This is it. Comes mm. down to this. There's a funny, funny fifth question or a good fifth question. I'm going to go with the good one. Okay. <laughs> we'll save the funny for later. Yeah. Because it's too serious. Yeah. We don't want another milk dud situation. No, exactly. <laughs> I learned my lesson. <laughs> this one will make you think, but okay. it's very broad. All right. <clears throat> Best movie whose title has four words. Jeez Louise. This title has four words. The Godfather Part Two. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> well, that coin's gonna take forever. Yeah, I can't even think. <laughs> now that you said that, I literally can't think of. Doesn't think as fast as he talks. Yeah, I got a process. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna go the other way, Uh-oh. and this is gonna be a very interesting fight. Fast and the Furious. That's the called, fourth. The fourth, oh, the fourth one. one. You're right. Or is it called Fast and Furious? The fourth one. The fourth one. I think it's Fast and the Furious, right? I thought it was called Fast and Furious. I could be wrong though. Sorry, internet just slowed down right when I needed it. 
That's how it works, right? This is the only Didn't time. slow down when I was looking up Halle Berry's before. name. <laughs> just Fast and Furious. The oh, before is no. just Fast and okay. Furious. Yeah, one more shot. You could go too fast, too furious. <laughs> Shh, don't help him. <laughs> <laughs> Tokyo. Fast and Furious sequel versus the Godfather, <laughs> the Godfather sequel. Tokyo uh, Drift. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. I got one. Can't give it to him. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, can I take his two Fast and Furious? I got an argument. Or is that is that misleading? Is that, okay, let's not cheat. Um, it's a little cheating. See, Joe, that's why you don't send him out there. You're right. <laughs> oh, Captain America: Civil War. Okay. There we go. Okay, Captain America Civil War versus Godfather Part 2, Dan. The Godfather Part 2. Okay, yes. The Godfather Part 2 is one of the best American or any other nation movies ever made. It is a story about family. It is a story about one man's soul and the redemption of that soul. The way that it parallels the story between the fall of Michael Corleone and the rise of Vito Corleone is so powerful. The way that you see the rise and fall of this family in America, it is one of the absolute, most incredibly well-structured and paced movies ever made. Koi. Captain America Civil War builds up from 10 films and then lands beautifully, illustrating everything right about superhero films. It is a good action film, it is a good drama, it is a good character study. You care about 10 plus characters in a film and they're all given beautiful arcs. The movie moves at a beautiful pace, it is rewatchable, it is entertaining. It has all the heart of a very good drama but with the action of a perfect superhero film. Dan, 10 seconds. Civil War is reliant completely on having seen 10 other movies, and it does not carry near the emotional weight of The Godfather Part 2 as anybody can watch The Godfather Part 2 and relate to it. It's about family. 10 seconds, Koi. The pacing of The Godfather Part 2 doesn't allow it to be the entertainment and the rewatchability of Captain America Civil War, and Civil War is a stronger movie as a movie because you can enjoy it by itself as often as you want. All right, <laughs> Hal. Um, I was thinking The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, I was also thinking The Wizard of Oz. Yep. Mm, that's a good one. Um, Dan. Joe. This one is, uh, this one is tough just based on the arguments. Uh, I think that the, uh, it's relying on ten other movies is a, is a strong one. I, by a little bit, I gotta go with Dan. Yeah, I don't think it was that close. Dan gets it. <laughs> It was oh, a tough call. God. Tough call. Dan, Dan, I mean, but Dan just really cried. I mean, I gotta give Koi props. Though. Yeah, that, that's an props. uphill battle. Yeah. Yeah. Uphill battle. You did Fighting you, Godfather you, uh, out of nowhere. I yeah. came Danny this close to saying Captain America: Civil War. Yeah. That's wow. the first thing. That Dan had to stumble yeah. a little bit, and he didn't. Ooh. He was on the top of his game, so that's where you got a little stuck there. But Dan, you did it. Yeah, oh, man. Man. Wow. That long last and happened. Oh my God. Man, that was the fight. that was the speed round. I think that everyone expected. That was that was epic. You know what? I'm actually glad that I lost and got to see you guys finally do. And, and Dude, very impressive. Like, yeah. very Took it impressive. to the end, as we expected. Yeah. All right, I've been teasing, and then we'll give you guys plugs. Fun to watch. God. Guys, we'll be here after the fight if you're watching Live on Plus. But for the next few weeks, we have some amazing live shows you will not want to miss here. We tape Thursdays on ScreenJunkies.com. And next week, we are doing an all-Star Wars Ooh. fight. What? Darth Harloff himself, Christian Harloff, will wow. be here. Maud Garrett. Dan Casey, he wrote a book on Star Wars. These three know their Star Wars. We are going to be debating. We've asked you for some, there are some amazing questions. So Star Wars movie fights yeah. next week. The week after that, the following yeah. Thursday, myself, Alicia Malone, and Ken Knapsack are coming back for the drunk championship Woo! belt. <laughs> we, wow. make, we, better, we need to make a belt with uh, gold beer cans. Andy, let me ask it's you, how many, be epic. how many Mike's Hard Lemonades are you going to kill that no, day? We're gonna, <laughs> here's, it's going to be serious because we're going to have a bartender who's going to give us all the same Ooh. drinks a to mixologist? make sure we all are drinking the same amounts. Uh, it's all going to be very uh, that's all, That police. sounds amazing. Yeah. It's going to be very good. So the next uh, couple Thursdays, you're in for a can big just, treat. Can I show up and just get drunk? Yeah, if you like. Great. <laughs> uh, you're on for a big treat. Uh, and then uh, I want to hype something else that we've been working on. We're in the midst of it, but we are prepping a nice... Uh, of the movie fights 100, we asked so many people for their favorite moments. Some of them might be in this, uh, you know, in the next batch uh, from this episode. But we are counting down the 50 best movie fight moments of all time. It's been so fun to look back. I know a lot of you asked, "What happened? What happened?" At the end of this month, we are going to give you a special on plus, super long breakdown of all the history of all the best moments, putting them in order, ranking them, giving you our behind the scenes uh, uh, insta uh, insta uh, insight on them. Uh, so stay tuned. It's coming soon. I'm so excited about Dan. You can vouch. It's going to be a lot of fun.
It is. We we spent way more time than we should have <laughs> ordering these moments, and I think that and if you're a fan of movie fights, you're going to really, really enjoy it. Yes, this and I have to thank Jack Shipley and so many other fans Screen who helped fans, compile yeah. a lot of this for us, because we had to go back and watch all 100. It's, it's just the first 100, uh, but there's so many good moments. Yeah. Hal, you're in there quite a few times. Oh, glad to hear it. Uh, but that's so much, so much fun stuff to stay tuned, so stay tuned. I'm so excited. Uh, Hal Rudnick at Hal Rudnick. Anything else you'd like to yes, plug? Yes, sir. Thanks for coming, um, good sir. Oh, I, I had a blast, and you guys were excellent. Um, I, I, yeah, you mentioned Star Wars and your Star Wars battle coming up next week. Today we had a Screen Junkie show where Christian Harloff, Ken Knapsack, myself, and Michael Barrett, who's a huge, uh, yep, has some great experts. Star Wars videos, um, we determined the best Star Wars character of all time. It's a great watch. It's uh, a screen Junkie episode. show on YouTube. And uh, yeah, hit me up on Twitter at Hal Rudnick. Coy Jandrew, anything you'd like to plug? Uh, you can find me at Coy Jandrew, C O Y J A N D R E A U, on Instagram and Twitter. And I host Marvel Movie News on Tuesdays and Screen Junkies people on Twitter. You guys helped me get here, and I appreciate. It. I love you guys so much, so hunt me down. Appreciate it. Dan Merle. Much Merle respect Dan. to these two gentlemen. It was the battle that I w was hoping it would be. Uh, yeah, at Merle Dan on Twitter. Uh, like Hal said, the Star Wars show is really fun. And uh, I'm going to give our friend Mark Andreco a plug for his uh, book, Love is Love, on mm -hmm. idwpublishing.com oh, yeah. so and excited. Amazon. It's coming up very soon. And, and it's, I, I, from everything I hear, it's going to be fantastic. He's kind of come can... back and announced some big stuff. We've oh, heard of big good. stuff. Pre-order. Yeah. Oh, I just want to give a shout out to our friend Jason Inman, who's yes. uh, sending comic books to troops mm -hmm. for the holidays. Oh, so, nice. um, yeah, hit up uh, Jason Inman. You know him from the host of uh, DC. At Jawin on Twitter. Yeah, at Jawin on Twitter. Send him your comic yeah. books. Uh, Joe Starr on the couch. Uh, I'm going to echo Twitter. They love this fight. This is one of my favorites. It was just, there was something just basic and fun and back to basics about that. Well basic, done, basic. all three of you guys. It's just basic, basic, basic. Uh, I want to thank uh, Robert Ebert for all of his opinions <laughs> and his weird three star rating. Uh, find me on Twitter at JoeStar187. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, everybody here. And thank you for watching at home. We will see you live after the fight here on Plus. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Star Wars next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks to NatureBox for sponsoring this episode. For more information, click the link in the description. And right now, you'll save even more because NatureBox is offering Screen Junkies fans 50% off your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash Screen Junkies. If you haven't already, subscribe to Screen Junkies on YouTube to join us for future fights. Or if you prefer to listen on iTunes, click the logo to download an audio version.